I am so loving my new balcony and the view behind me. Look at that, so beautiful. Hi, this is Margaret Bird and welcome to Color Quest. And summer has finally arrived, I think. Now, this view behind me is filled with all kinds of evergreen trees and some deciduous that are common here in the Pacific Northwest. There are all kinds of trees around the world that can produce different colors in your dye pot. So for the next month, the month of July, I'm going to be looking at different kinds of wood that can bring dye colors for your natural color practice. And none of these are trees that grow native here in the state of Washington. Being able to sample color from your environment is such an amazing way to enjoy your surroundings as well as understand a bit more about the flora that you live in. However, trying different dye sources from different parts of the world is also an amazing way to expand your understanding of natural color and just bring different colors to your dye pod. Today we will be looking at the first in a series of wood-based dyes, and that is sapin wood. So join me as we look to have an expanded palette with the different ways in which we can take sapin wood and invite different colors into our dye practice. Let's go. Something about natural color that I absolutely adore is that A, you don't always get what you think you're going to get based upon the color of the plant or the dye matter itself, but B, there are several dye matters that can have different colors based upon how you process them or how you extract the color. Last week, we looked at safflower, which we were able to shift from a yellow to a vivid pink by playing around with the pH of our water or dye bath. And that is one way that many dye matters can be shifted. Another way that you can shift the color of natural dye is through the use of some metal modifiers in particular, iron is a wonderful way to modify color. It can also be used as a mordant. So when you use iron to shift a color, it also improves that bond to the fiber so color sticks around. There's a few other metals that you can use as a modifier, but in my dye practice, I'm only using currently iron and it has so many applications. Now, another way that you can change the color is by using different strengths of your dye matter to the weight of fiber. So there are different percentages that will yield certain colors. Oftentimes it's a one-to-one -one ratio, as you've heard me mention many times. But sometimes you can achieve lighter and darker shades by changing your percentages or your ratio percentages between your dye matter and your fiber. Today, we'll be looking at all of those ways in which satin wood can bring us five different colors, or I'm gonna try to get five different colors. And that will be through different percentages of dye matter to the weight of fiber using pH shifts, both acidic and alkaline, as well as introducing some iron. And let's see what five colors this amazing wood is going to bring us. Now, I have not used sapin wood in this form ever. So this is new to me. Now, sapin wood is related and sometimes called Eastern Brazil wood. I have 
used Brazil wood. Brazil wood is common to Central and South America, whereas sapin wood itself is found in the Asia continental region. So I will be expecting maybe something similar. So both sapin wood and Brazil wood will bring about colors in the red family. And by doing these various shifts and different methods, we may be able to expand that red to pinks, corals, and even into magentas and darker burgundy reds. So it can be incredibly versatile. Now it's not local to me here, as I mentioned, so it is a big treat for me to be able to have sapin wood to test. I purchased this sapin wood from Botanical Colors, which is where I get many of my dye resources that I can't locally forage, as well as mordant and modifier products. I'm going to be following a combination of instructions, both on the how-to section from the Botanical Color website, as well as from some other resources that I have found that are slightly different in how you may handle sapin wood. So let's get started. So the first way we're going to see if we can get different colors is through the differences in the percentage of the sapin wood as compared to the weight of fiber. Now we're going to start off with 20% as one dye bath and we're going to try another dye bath at 100%. We're gonna see what these two different percentages might do to the same type of fiber, meaning we'll use the same piece of fiber prepared the same way. And that is a cotton piece that has been pre-treated with aluminum acetate. You can go back to learn how to do that or if you buy aluminum acetate from a place like Botanical Colors, they will have good instructions on how to use that. So first things first is we need to weigh our fiber. By this point, you are used to these wonderful pieces of cotton. They are sold by Dharma Trading and 100% cotton. And I just love the size of them they're great for doing all kinds of different projects and wonderful sample pieces so i have five of these and for the 20 percent version of the sapin wood i'm only going to dye one piece with that so for the other four pieces i'm going to dye all of these at 100 percent we will be shifting the color in different ways so i want to just have four that are at the recommended 100% for the sort of traditional sap and wood color, around 55, 56 grams for those. So we will need 55, 56 grams of the sap and wood sawdust for these four. And for this one, we're gonna do just 20% of 14. Let's do a little math. So my scale isn't super precision, and as you know, I'm not a precision person. Kind of goes back and forth between 13 and 14. So let's just do 14. So if I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be starting at 14 grams, and then I'm gonna be multiplying this times 20%. And by doing this, I'm gonna figure out how many grams I'm gonna need. So I will need approximately, let's say, three grams of sap and wood sawdust, and that'll give me approximately 20%. So let's measure that first. So here's my sap and wood sawdust. And taking any dye matter down to smaller pieces is always gonna help with extracting color more easily. So Botanical Colors has done a great job in providing sawdust as opposed to whole branches or pieces of wood. So we'll be looking to measure about three grams here. There we go. So you can see that three grams, it's about that much, not a ton. And then we will put this into the dye pot and cover it with water like we always do and do an initial simmer on the stove. So you can already see the pink coming. 
and we're actually going to let this simmer and then soak overnight so that we can pull as much of the color as possible that way. So for the four pieces, I'm gonna look to put somewhere between five and six grams to get to 100%. There we go, there's a little bit extra. I think I'll take that out. Don't wanna waste it. We'll do exactly the same thing. Put it into a pot, cover with water, let it simmer for about 30 to 45 minutes, then we'll turn it off and let it cool overnight extract as much color as we can. There is the 100% and there is the 20%. Don't know if you can see a difference. Logic would tell you that this is going to be a deeper color. You can sort of see it in the two, but we'll see how that translates on to fiber. So that was unexpected. A couple things could have happened there. One is that there's only so much of a pH modifier you can put in before it begins to change the integrity of the dye. So you're gonna to wanna to add your pH modifier slowly. 
you have an exact measurement like we did with the calcium carbonate, fantastic. But as you noticed with the lemon juice, I sort of eyeballed it. And there's a high probability that I took the pH too far in either direction. There was no science there. And since I'm not using citric acid or a soda ash that I knew the alkaline content of, it was kind of a trial and error. If you wanna be cautious of that, be prepared to have things not go as planned or go ahead and use measured percentages. So I said that we were going to do five, but since I threw in an extra by trying the soda ash as an alkaline shift alternative to the calcium carbonate, we still have iron to do. So let's step through the process of making iron water and we'll shift one final piece of fiber with that. Well, Sappenwood, thank you for that journey through some various colors using modifiers both in a pH realm and in the form of iron. Now, remember iron's a mordant, so that color is going to be quite secure to the fiber. Your pH modifiers have the potential of shifting back, so you need to be careful by not introducing those fibers to the opposite on the pH spectrum. So if you sprinkle a little bit of an acid onto an alkaline, it will shift that color. So you just have to be aware of that. The color can shift back. The other thing I want to make a note of is that you probably noticed that I had sprinkles of different colors inside of the small samples that I showed you. Unfortunately, that was caused by having some dispersed iron. Now, when you are working with things like iron, besides being cautious of wearing a mask, to protect yourself from ingesting anything that becomes airborne, you also want to be aware that it is easy for iron powder in particular to make its way across your space and it can easily contaminate other fibers. So don't do as I do, <laughs> be a little more cautious and know that when you're working with iron, you're going to want to be very careful with it and clean up your surfaces 
after you've used it so that you know that you don't get iron on other things. Unless you want a nice speckled effect like I had. So next week, let's continue our journey with wood and how it can bring color to our dye pot. And this time we're gonna bring it back to North America with a tree that is native to this part of the world and that is Osage. So have a great week and I look forward to seeing you next Friday as we explore more colors of trees from around the world. All of the same different, under all of the same, under all of, under all of the same, I want to say,